Tanita Cheatham, thank you so much for tuning in. You know, today we're going to talk about the prevailing perceptions and misconceptions regarding hip hop and rap music. Joining me in this discussion today is David Thigpen, a staff music correspondent for Time Magazine. David recently published the book Jam Master J, The Heart of Hip Hop, a biography of the late rapper Jam Master J of Run DMC fame. And as you know, he was killed some months ago in uh, New York. Thank you, David, for coming to the program. So glad to have you here. Glad to be here. And we're going to talk about your book a little bit later mm -hmm. on. But let's, mm -hmm. let's discuss some of the perceptions uh, as it relates to uh, rap and hip hop and even some of the misconceptions. You've been writing for time for like 18 years mm -hmm. in this capacity. And what have you come upon or what have you concluded with regard to that? Well, um, you have to understand that hip hop is a very important art form. It's the uh, it's the youth art form now, so it's going to tend to uh, embody the things that young people are thinking about and feeling strongly about now, and that's good and bad. So you're going to have gangster rap and hip hop on the one extreme, and then you're going to have sort of roots music and hip hop on the other extreme and they're sort of going to play off each other so there's going to be kind of a interesting dialogue in hip hop you know hip hop it really is the most vital art form right now it's very important to young people mm -hmm. it's their rock and roll mm -hmm. right and and kids live or die by it um, they believe in its messages it's very very important to kids so so it's very important to culture now and so people have to look at it that way, that uh, that it's it's something very important, and they have to figure out how they can listen to it and not just dismiss it from its from its surface. It's not a perfect art form, mm -hmm. you know, nothing is, mm -hmm. but there's some very important things in it that are worth listening to. I think about uh, because I'm not so young uh, that uh, I wasn't around when uh, rap hip hop first came on the scene in the in the 70s, mm -hmm. and I think about artists at that time uh, as we talk about Grandmaster Flash. Uh, Run DMC mm -hmm. at the time, uh, Sugar Hill Gang, yeah. Curtis Blow, yeah. um, those type of people. And a, a lot of them, they were talking about some of the things that were happening within their lives, but a lot of it was just fun. You mm -hmm. know, different things that happened that were either silly or something that was funny uh, that they were talking about. But I see how it's really evolved since that time. Mm -hmm. And it's taken on different connotations, some being violent. Yeah. you know, uh, negative, some being exploitive, particularly with women. Mm -hmm. uh, other talk about excess with regard to materialism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when did that, that change start to happen? When did that become customary uh, or accepted to start talking about these other different things? Yeah, I would say that um, you're, you're talking about gangster rap, and I think that really got popular, started to get popular in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dre was one of the big producers who was very influential mm -hmm. in that. With uh, uh, N.W.A. Yes, mm -hmm. and out of California. Yes, um, that, that's when that happened. Um, the reason reason for that is uh, it, it, um, gangster rap was sort of experimental back then. No one knew it was going to take off like it did. Uh, they didn't expect it. Well, um, no. Well, no one expected it to do anything. I mean, mm -hmm. no one was sure. It was. It was. Because um, it was kind of underground, just, wasn't it? It was pretty much underground, yes, and it was it was brand new, but it turned out to be popular and and like certain things do, it sort of struck a chord somehow in society. And when something like that strikes a chord and begins to catch on, then the record companies notice this and they see that people are interested in this and people are buying this and they say, Let's put more of it out. Mm -hmm. And so it tends to build on itself tends to build on itself and um, uh, that 
can be a problem when you get to be too much of it, which is, I think, probably what you're seeing today. There's a lot of gangster rap. It gets a lot of attention in the media, mm -hmm. right? But it's selling terribly well. So the record companies themselves are going to, it. yeah, push it because it's a money-making, it's a money-making uh, venture for them. There are other kinds of rap that are out there as well that, pro that are not selling as well mm -hmm. that have positive messages. Um, but this is this is the way marketplaces work sometimes, and we happen to be in a culture now that is really res re really responds to sort of visceral kind of art forms. By that I mean sex and violence. Mm -hmm. You see it not just in hip hop music. You see it in movies. You see it in TV. You see it across the board. So so it's it's not just hip hop where it is. You know the and and there's a very strong argument to be made. Th that hip hop is reflecting what's going on in the culture. Mm -hmm. It's not, you see, it's not creating a reality that's not already out there. It's mirroring it. It's mirroring it, yes. Let's back up for a moment because we were kind of talking about this before the program. Um, there seems to be, a, 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 and it may seem to be kind of harsh, a, 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 a demonization of rap and hip hop because mm -hmm. the vast majority of the artists are African American. Mm -hmm. um, but the argument that I bring up, I mean whatever issues I have with regard to that, that form of music notwithstanding, I think about the same kind of negative connotation as it relates to rock and roll, heavy metal, mm -hmm. punk rock, mm -hmm. sure. um, which have more of a uh, white audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting however though that um, rap and hip hop have crossover appeal, yeah. and so it leads me to question why this demonization of this particular uh, type of music, as opposed to others sure. that have spurned the same kind of reactions. Yeah. And yeah. I find that interesting. Yeah, well, a lot of the issues that you hear in hip hop are quote unquote black issues or minority issues. They're about things that are happening in the ghetto, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are happening in the hood, right? Mm -hmm. And those are messages that maybe a lot of America doesn't want to hear in a very raw form. You know, people live in their own little worlds. People generally live in their own bubbles, in their own lives, and don't really know what's going on in, in other parts of society. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one of the real powers of, of hip-hop music, is that its messages have been able to cut through a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of the noise, you know, a lot of the cultural noise, and reach people and music has, has reached kids out in the suburbs. Kids in the suburbs love hip hop, are mm -hmm. buying it. That's why it's you know it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And see, and that that is a quite an achievement because suddenly you have a kid out in the suburb. He knows who Snoop Doggy Dog is. You know, he knows who Dr. Dre is. He knows who N.W.A. is. And maybe he knows these. He knows who Eminem is, obviously. Mm -hmm. And maybe he knows some of these songs. Maybe he knows what the lyrics are talking about. And maybe the lyrics are talking about. Going to you know um, going to a, a a lousy school with lousy teachers, um, uh, having to worry about getting shot in the hallway of your of your uh, junior high school, not Which being is able not just indicative to inner city schools anymore. Correct, correct. Um, uh, it, you know, not being able to learn and how that how that can um, build up in a person and and so so it's great that these messages are sort of getting out and that's that's how you that's how you change society so it's but, but it's natural it's natural for people to sort of uh, demonize that because these are messages that people don't want to hear and a lot of people will sort of deny that that this is the way it is, is in, in the city this yes so it's natural and and this is the same pattern we saw when rock and roll came along right remember the older generation didn't didn't want to hear it there were mm -hmm. a thousand jokes about that um, it, when 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 the blues came along um, and and R and B, um, uh, you know, older black folks who were who were into jazz didn't want to hear R and B because mm -hmm. it was because it was visceral, it was dirty, it was it see, et cetera. So 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 it's it's kind of repeating some of the same patterns that that you that you always see, and you find people who are not <laughs> not old, uh, who are in their forties, mm -hmm. say who. Um, feel the same way about hip hop now that it's just noise that there's no value to it that like what are these kids listening to you know mm -hmm. i can't i can't stand this i mean you hear you hear this in any household in the in the country so but the reason people are demonizing it is because it's 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 very much bound up with issues that are at the core of of black america of african american 
America and and how it's affecting their lives, and those are tough issues to uh, to grapple with, and and people people have a hard time with it. So, let me yeah. throw this out, and then this may be a, a loaded question: Do you think that any, to some degree, the fact that you have so many uh, young African American artists mm -hmm. making millions? off this music form. Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe that in any way contributes to the uh, negative rap that they get? I think um, some people certainly resent that um, because they see young African American men uh, making a whole lot of money. Um, More at, than I probably at, would at, in my <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I think that that probably adds to the resentment though, but I, but I, I tend to think that um, you know, hip hop cultivates an, an outlaw image. That that is part of it, and that will always be there. And that sells. That especially sells among young folks, right? Because young folks, when you're in your teens, you probably uh, you probably uh, are sick of your parents, right? You're sick of school. Never. Right. I love my. You see, <laughs> you're uh, you don't like the police, yeah. right? You don't like. You, you, there are very few things you like. You, you like your friends. Mm -hmm. You like your music. You know. You like hanging out. Like you, you like your car, right? Yeah. Any music that is going to deal with those kind of issues is probably going to appeal to you. And if your parents don't like the music, that's even better, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it gets it makes your parents mad. Then you really know it's yours. It's part of your generation. It's it's your message. It's your statement. So so it's it's a it's a rite of passage for every kind of you know teenager to grab something that that is their own and and uh, and to assert it. And so those those are the kind of messages we're getting you know mm -hmm. from. From, from hip hop. Now we've talked about a lot of the perception out there, particularly the negative perceptions uh, with regard that are associated with this music form. Um, you have been writing uh, with regard about music for mm -hmm. many years, mm -hmm. and I just, what in your experience do you find are the misconceptions? You know, things that um, people may perceive about this music form that's not necessarily true? Sure. Um, well, there are many. I would say mainly is that uh, people tend to think that the rappers, the things they see on videos uh, are real. <laughs> and, and that the and you've been on different sets, haven't you? Yeah, have you yes, I have. Yeah, many of them, many mm -hmm. of them. And, you know, very often, uh, if we see a rapper um, in a club or whatever in a video, you know, wearing, he's, he's you know, covered in gold, gold chains, uh, and those he, are not and he, and, No, you know those are rented, right? <laughs> <laughs> those are rented, and he goes out and he gets in a in a, in a Mercedes Benz, and you know that that Mercedes Benz is rented too. You know most of these artists cannot afford the that kind of lifestyles that no, they're projecting no. in yeah, the videos. Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is called you know theatrics, and this is called presenting an, an image, and not to burst the bubble, but it. It sells. It's cool. It looks. It looks neat. You know so, that is not the reality. Of so again, it's the the marketing executives or the uh, record companies that are pushing this image. Sure, and the rappers themselves uh, mm -hmm. um, like it too. It's now you're almost obligated to. Uh, you know, I think Fifty Cent said recently before Fifty Cent even had a had a record out. Right, Fifty Cent was walking around with um, you know uh, big old you know gold or or you know diamond chain around his neck. I mean, he didn't have, even have a record out yet, so he wasn't making any money. Mm. But see, but that's that's part of you know that's part of the uh, part of the outfit, and and it conveys a sense of legitimacy when when kids out there watching TV see that they say, oh wow, well that that's cool, you know, that's cool, and it. it you know, not only does it—I mean, it, it'll it'll help sell gold chain. It helps sell things, right? I mean, if you if you if you put a car in a video, people are going to go out and they're going to want to get that car. If you wear a T-shirt, people are going to want to get that T-shirt, the hat, you know, the whole thing. Because 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 kids imitate these rappers because they they uh, they they admire them. So so it's it's really it's just you know it's part of the it's part of the act. So people should know that that's not reality. Well, see, you just taught me something. I had no clue. Yeah. I had no clue. Yeah, it's all rented. <laughs> <laughs> they had to give it back. At the end of they the do. Day. They do. They do. And often they have somebody standing on the set who takes it back. As soon as they turn that camera off, 
He comes and gets it. Says, give me that. This is going back to the store. Because <laughs> you can't afford it. <laughs> So what else have you seen? What other uh, misconceptions do we need to, uh, that, that would be uncovered? Well, I think that there, there, is, um, there is an illusion that, uh, that rappers are into violence, that they live, that they all live violent lives. And well, you know what supports that, though. You see people like Tupac Secure, Secure my goodness, mm -hmm. and Biggie Small, right. and then recently with uh, uh, yeah. Jam Master J, yeah. which is interesting. He didn't lead, or at least in the public or in the media, you didn't no. see negative things associated no, with no, him. No, not so at I all. I found that interesting not as at all. well. Yeah, you know, Tupac did leave, leave a, uh, lead a violent yeah. life. He mm -hmm. did. There's no so there's question some about that. Yes, yes. Now, Biggie, um, it's still unclear who shot Biggie, but uh, Biggie did not lead a violent life either. Biggie was just targeted by someone who was trying to get back at someone else, something, something like that, um, and which makes his shooting all the more worse. Same thing with Jam Master J. Jam Master J was really a family man, you know, a great guy, young guy, 37 years old, had three kids, had a very attractive wife. His, his wife is, you know, he didn't, he didn't meet her at a record industry party or something like that. She was a very solid, intelligent person. Mm -hmm. He lived not far from where he grew up in Queens. Um, he owned a studio. He was building his own own business. He didn't run the streets. Um, you know, he didn't he didn't do drugs. He he was really a grown up. You know, felt a lot of responsibility for his family. Was out working very hard. Was really well liked in his neighborhood, mm -hmm. and and was not a violent person. And it's unclear uh, who killed him as well, or exactly what it was about. It may have been may have been over a debt or some sort of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's unclear, but he was very well liked. Was really a hero in his own neighborhood. You know, I find it interesting with these different uh, um, rap artists, musicians within the you know recent years that were um, slain. I find it interesting that their cases remain unsolved. Yeah. They don't know, at least they haven't arrested anyone yeah. for uh, Tupac or Biggie, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, James. And then, like, with 50 Cent, he was shot nine times. Yes. And something you told me that I didn't know, that uh, he was a protege of, of Jam Master, Jam Master J. J. Yes, yeah. 50 Cent grew up in Queens, uh, not too far from where Jam Master J grew up. And they met in Queens, and um, uh, Jay brought 50 Cent up to his studio, because Jay owned a studio in Queens and would very often let kids from the neighborhood or anybody who needed studio time come up. He brought 50 Cent up there because he, he saw something that he thought was marketable and good. And 50 Cent brought him up there and they did, uh, did, some, uh, did some demos. And those demos sort of circulated and that, and that helped build the, 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 all the, the street buzz on mm -hmm. 50 Cent, which eventually led him to you know, sign a deal with Eminem and, and, uh, and Dr. Dre's label. Well, people will tell you that Eminem was the one that discovered him when in actuality maybe Jay delivered him. Correct. It was, it was absolutely, him. yes, it was absolutely Jam Master. Jam Master Jay was the first guy to to record 50 Cent and, and you can ask, 50 Cent will say that Jam Master Jay was the one who gave him a chance and the Jam Master Jay taught him how to structure a song. Mm -hmm. 50, Cent, 50 Cent knew how to rap, right? He, he was a good natural rapper. He knew how to rap, but he had no idea how to structure a song or or do anything like that. And and Jay brought him up to the studio, taught him, taught him all that. Mm -hmm. So um, and we also talked about this and I didn't know that they fifty cents was questioned. Yes. Uh, when Jam Master Jay uh, was killed. Yes. That there may have been some tie in with the people that shot him. Yes. Yeah. That was one of the theories at the time. I mean the police were really groping for theories because they had no idea who, who shot him. But um, since uh, 50 Cent had, 50 Cent used to be a drug dealer in mm -hmm. Queens, and um, this was, uh, in fact, in the late 90s, and and he was shot in some sort of drug-related incident, mm -hmm. and had since taken to wear, wearing a bulletproof vest wherever he went, uh, and had still had some enemies on the street. Mm -hmm. So one of the theories was that perhaps someone trying to get at 50 Cent had killed Jay, or perhaps they thought that 50 Cent was in the studio with Jay at the time, or 
you know, who knows? It was one of the one of the theories, and they did question Fifty Cent, and uh, Fifty Cent said he had nothing to do with it and didn't know what had happened. And I think that's that's the truth. I think it was just just a coincidence that that uh, that, that this would happen. So I think Fifty Cent is 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 clean as far as that goes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I always found that interesting that the uh, different uh, uh, acts of violence upon these musicians mm -hmm. over the past couple of years. None of the cases have been resolved. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're what right. What's your theory with regard to that? I, well, I, I it, think that's fascinating. Yeah, it's it's a number of things. It's really sad because um, you know I know out out in Hollis, Queens, where where Jay is from, yeah, that his killing was a terrible thing you know, for the neighborhood because Jay was so popular. You know, mm -hmm. kids loved him, everybody loved him, everybody loved him in the neighborhood. So so for there, he was killed six months ago. So for there to be no arrests, you know, no prime suspect is just really bad and the police are looking but they're, they're not getting a whole lot of help on the street I think people are afraid to talk about it mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know it's just I don't know it's just one of those things um, uh, with the Biggie case uh, I think there is some evidence that um, um, I mean I sh shouldn't make this as an accusation but there's some evidence that there may have been some off-duty LA PD involved and there may be some connections with with Suge Knight, mm. but I think that was that was poor police investigating, plus no cooperation on the street. Mm -hmm. I think in the Jam Master J case, people are afraid to talk because whoever did this was from the neighborhood, mm. was a local person, and I think they feel that the police aren't going to protect them if they come forward and say, "Okay, I heard so and so told me that so and so said mm. that." he was at the studio that night and, and you know any sort of clue I think people are afraid that they'll be next mm -hmm. if if they say anything and um, that's that's a shame because this is you know there it takes cooperation to break a case like this mm -hmm. and uh, what what else is very discouraging is that there is a big reward out in the Jam Master J case there's a $250,000 reward for information about the killer and no one has taken that yet mm -hmm. so the only thing that can lead me to to believe why that is the case is that there must be some intimidation going on the street people are afraid mm -hmm. people are afraid even for that amount of money which which really says something which is which is really sad because this is the kind of case that really needs to get solved some kind of closure yeah we're going to talk about that when we come back and about your book stay tuned we'll be right back <laughs> And today we are joined by David Thigpen, who is a writer for Time Magazine. He's a musical writer. I've been with Time for a long time. And we're talking about the pre, uh, perceptions and the misconceptions uh, as it relates to rap and hip-hop music and culture. And before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, Jam Master Jay's uh, uh, tragic uh, and unfortunate and certainly uh, too soon demise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you talk a lot about that in the book you have recently uh, published. And the name of the book is Jam Master J, mm -hmm. The Heart of Hip Hop. And it's yes. a biography. And let's talk about you. Uh, why, did, why did you uh, decide to write about this book? We kind of talked about this before the show sure. about how um, he was a low-key guy, pretty much. He was the, the record spinner for Run DMC. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the two front guys were more visible, mm -hmm. but um, he was very low-key, and as far as uh, media reports, you didn't hear much about him until he was killed, as opposed to other more notorious uh, type rappers. Sure, so, sure. Well, yeah, up. well, he's, he was a very important figure, not only to Run DMC, but to all of hip-hop. And he came along at a time when hip-hop was, hip-hop music was still building still developing and he came up with a particular sound he created a sound that very kind of raw from the streets kind of sound and that kind of stuck and all of hip-hop is sort of followed that 
and Jay was really one of the one of the creators of that back in the back in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, as a DJ, um, before Jay and a couple of guys before him, the DJ was never really considered a musician. The mm -hmm. DJ would would sit in a club and spin cuts, and people would people would dance. Well, people like Jay began spinning cuts, but not only spinning cuts, but mixing cuts, right? And and changing cuts, so playing two things at once, and and just taking taking the breaks from songs, um, you know, the part without lyrics, and then mixing them together, so you can create sort of your your whole own you know kind of song. Mm -hmm. And then and then people began rapping over that, and then pretty soon you know you had sort of this whole new kind of art form developing. And so DJs were really like these pioneers, you know, who 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 developed this whole whole new art form. Jay was very instrumental in that, and and was very skilled at it. You know, Jay, for instance, when Run DMC played at Madison Square Garden, 19,000 people there, entire arena, you know, as big as the United Center, right? Mm -hmm. No instruments on stage, nothing, nothing. Just three guys, two rappers, one guy behind two turntables. Jay created every sound for every song that went in there, just spinning records, using, using his hands, filled an arena with sound. You know, who could do that? No instruments, so right? So just added a whole new dynamic yes, to the whole DJ thing. Yes, and kept, the, kept the, and could do this for hours on end, could do this for two hours and drive a, drive a crowd crazy, right? So it's a real skill. It's a real skill, and that's something he developed. And thirdly, another thing that people don't uh, remember about Jay is that... Um, Jay really set uh, the clothing style of hip hop quite a bit. Yes. Jay, Jay was the first yes. one to wear the to wear the white Adidas without right? the shoestrings. Yeah, without the shoestrings and the black and the black hat mm -hmm. and and the gold chains. When they got when they first uh, got Run DMC together, the other guys were they were like college freshmen. They were dressing like you know kind of nerds, you know. And Jay came in. Jay came in, Jay was cool, you know, had on all black, you know, black leather jacket, black hat, right? Mm -hmm. You know, gold rope around his neck, right? Some some completely fresh white Adidas. And they looked at him, I said, Wow, you know, that's that's uh, you know, can we get that look? And and that set the look of the group. Mm -hmm. And and that this has been imitated, this has gone around the world. Yeah. Right? When Run DMC went to went to on tour in Japan, people met them at the airport, right? Japanese kids met them at the airport wearing white Adidas. And black hats. Now, See, this has gone around the world. So let's deviate for a moment because that was one thing I wanted to ask you as we talk about crossover appeal. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more or less of my limited mind within the United States. Let's talk about the influence of rap and hip hop culture internationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Um, if you go to pretty much any place in the world now, you know, even China um, and and Russia, places that you really wouldn't expect, you will see vestiges of it. Either you'll see American videos, you'll see clothing styles on the streets, or you know, you'll even hear it in 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 the way in the way people talk. But especially in Western Europe and and Japan, where they really had an affinity for it, and particularly Japan, which is which is truly amazing because because you know obviously the, the, it's a gigantic language barrier. Um, but uh, Japan, you know, Tokyo when when Run DMC toured Japan back in the 80s, that that caught fire back then. So so hip hop is still very popular in Japan, mm -hmm. and kids. Cut their hair short into into like afros, in in Japan. Okay. They go to tanning salons, and they and they get their and they get their skin darkened, and and they <laughs> and yeah, it's it's really it's really something else to see. So they and really embrace they it. They really embrace it, and 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 they know the lyrics, they know the words. They don't know English, but they but they but know they the, can word. say the words. Yes, they okay. know the words, and it's really gone far. I mean, it's a gigantic. Uh, it's a gigantic market over there. It's really remarkable. And then, of course, you know, all over all over Europe, it's it's very popular. And France and England have produced their own rappers. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's where Slick Rick came from. You know, for, uh, um, from England. That's and, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Slick Rick is English. Um, and there were there were rap clubs. You know, all over Western Europe, you know, Germany, um, where have you. So so it's really turned into an international. Of course, and and it has yeah, it has yeah. yes, it has it's gone around the world yes, and uh, it's a it's a it's a vast worldwide worldwide business. But it's just remarkable to think that a lot of these styles began back in Hollis Queens. Yeah. you know, with mm -hmm. with with uh, somebody yeah, somebody like Jam Master Jay picking out 
his wardrobe, going down to the store, you know, on the avenue, picking out his wardrobe, and then and then wearing it, and then everybody looking at it and saying, you know, this is cool. I got to get get what he's got, and it and it catch catching on. Uh, so Jay, very influential in sending that style. And then of course um, uh, Adidas, um, the the white Adidas. You know, the Adidas company, of course, was smart enough. Adidas is, is a German company, mm -hmm. by the way. Adidas was smart enough to sign a contract with Run DMC to promote their shoes. Their and of course, shoes. yes, and their sales went up tremendously. Because mm -hmm. um, that was the thing, Adidas shoes. Uh, yes. No laced Adidas shoes. Exactly right. Yeah, their 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 sales, you know, skyrocketed, and anything anything rappers endorse tend tend to uh, mm -hmm. tend to tend, tend to rise in sales. But um, uh, this is this is the way it was. A lot of that goes back to Jay. You know? I think about too when you watch these uh, documentaries, or they call them rockumentaries, uh, where you have new upcoming and, and relatively new uh, artists mm -hmm. when they talk about you know your influences who influenced you and oftentimes they refer to run DMC sure and um, that they kind of set the tone yes they did yeah I mean in so in so many ways and um, you know musically um, they're uh, they're the, that that very raw street sound you really you hear it in all of hip-hop still I mean you hear it with Eminem now and it's the idea that that if it's from the street, it's legitimate and it's and it's real, and that you can and that you can sort of uh, you can bank on it that it that it's reality and it's truth. Well, now that you told me that you know they don't really live the lives that they project on the TV, I don't know now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to question that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, certainly I understand what you're saying with regards to that. Um, let's talk a bit, and we'll get back to the book in a minute. But let's come back and talk about as we relate to perceptions. Uh, you think about these younger, I mean, like children, like uh, artists, rap mm -hmm. artists, like mm -hmm. Bow Wow, mm -hmm. Little Romeo. Mm -hmm. um, can't think of any others right now. But when they come out, they have nice, you know, a clean sound. Uh, they talk about cute things, a little girlfriend in school, or uh, I play basketball well, that kind of thing. Um, and now that's that's how they're packaged. That's what they talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Do you think that as they evolve, particularly if they stay popular, if they stay famous and, and, and good at what they do, that they may evolve and stray and turn to hardcore or violent rap? Or, you know, I guess the ultimate question is: there still a demographic that can appreciate clean rap? Yes. And it is still be sellable. Oh yes, yes, there is. Um, that market is not as big as the market for gangster rap right that's it's not it's not that big but there absolutely is still a market for it uh, and there are, a, there are a number of artists who have done okay making clean rap and uh, you know Will Smith is a, is a good example okay, you know so, yes. Will Smith had a, a fantastic album um, a few years ago that sold probably three or four million maybe maybe even five million and you know obviously his his raps are uh, are, are, are clean and you've got you've got groups like uh, the Roots um, from Philadelphia, who were, you know, just a fantastic uh, uh, group, very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a group. Uh, I like, want Heavy D and the Boys to come back. You like Heavy D and I the Boys? I love Heavy yeah, D. Yeah, well, the they boys. were very entertaining. Yeah. That's a yeah. that's a that's a great group. You know, the the market is not as big as as it is for gangster rap, but 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 it's still there. Um, I don't think the younger artists will necessarily have to go over to gangster rap to succeed. Now. If they are able to still come up with with good songs, because that is really what people want to hear. Mm -hmm. They want to hear good songs. They want to hear a beat that they like. They want to hear clever wordplay. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to feel something mm -hmm. from from the music. And if you can do that, and you can do that in a clean way, kids are going to going to respond to it. I mean, kids are buying. She's not exactly a rapper, but kids are buying um, uh, the the J Lo record. Mm -hmm. You know, J Lo. J Lo is not a great musician. J Lo's J Lo's pretty good. She's got an okay voice, but the song, some of the songs are just catchy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just catchy, catchy songs, and that's and that's pretty much all it takes. You know, people forget. And she's a good dancer. I think. And she, <laughs> I mean, if you dance, it's true. With it, then I think that kind of she looks good in the out. video. Yeah, she looks good yeah. in the video. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about, uh, I think about uh, Little Romeo, his father, Master P. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not that familiar with his music, but is mm -hmm. his music 
Does it yeah, take it's to be gangster violent? rap. Gangster yeah. rap. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Rap. So who's to say that as Little Romeo grows that that may not happen? Well, it may it may happen, but with someone like Little Romeo, I mean, it's all dependent on the, who the people are around him, and, and I'm sure Master P is guiding his mm -hmm. his career now. So uh, I don't think we can we can predict that. But you know, also depends on who who the producers are and and what the climate is now. Well, the time Little Romeo gets older, of course. This gangster rap bubble may have burst. This this will not go you on think? forever. Yes, yeah, so it it will not go on forever. It can't. Nothing goes on forever, right? It will it will it will reach a saturation point where people will just say, okay, I've had enough of that, and they'll stop buying these records. And let's do something different. Yes, and then someone will finally have the courage to do something different. And see, the problem is when something gets gets as popular as that is everybody imitates it. See, that's the thing about the music industry is mm -hmm. there's very little original thought going on, mm -hmm. right? Would, when somebody, yeah, and you can't blame them in a way. When, when you see success, especially success on the scale of, of Eminem or 50 Cent, you know, selling, I think 50 Cent has uh, sold, I believe, over four million records already. And, and that his record, his debut record's been out maybe four weeks. Um, when you see success on that kind of scale, mm -hmm. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to take a chance and do something that that no one's ever heard of, or you're going to do something that you think is going definitely going to sell. So there's a lot of pressure on on artists to sort of imitate that because that's obviously where the market is. See, so in and in the record business, it, it, it's about making money. It's not you know. It's, and that's it's, the bottom it's, line. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, Yes. What makes yes. Money. The creativity and 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 the good stuff that happens is unfortunately very often a, a byproduct of mm -hmm. of you know. I think about artists like Erica Badu, uh, 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 Jill Indy Scott, Irie. Indian mm -hmm. Irie, mm -hmm. uh, people like that that really you know on the R and B mm -hmm. um, uh, type um, tip um, that and and. Can, to some degree, maybe well, no, not so much hip hop, but I, I really pre appreciate artists like that. Mm -hmm. That uh, and I think what they talk about is expression. You know what yeah. their experiences are and what expression is, yes. things of that nature. And I find that they are very um, talented as well. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. really cool. But so you were talking about some of the things that inspired you, inspired you to uh, write the book. Yes. What were some things uh, that were, I guess, that were eye opening for you mm -hmm. while you were. Uh, within this process of putting this book together that just yeah. really kind of blew you away that you'd anticipate? Yeah. Well, one thing was uh, I was very impressed at the number of people that turned out for his, f his funeral. You know, here he was. He was not, a, not the biggest media figure around. Precisely. He had a very large funeral out in Queens, and, and really it, his, his death obviously affected a lot of people mm -hmm. very deeply. And it really, really hit people. And that, that said to me that here's someone who lived a life that had a lot of value in it to a lot of people. And obviously influenced people. Yes, and they were willing to, willing to come out and, and you could see people's faces coming out of the cathedral and you could tell that this was just something that was just so wrong. And, you know, here was a person, here was the last guy that everybody thought would be the one to go. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a hundred, hundred rappers out there who who has this who, negative who, connotation yeah, behind who, who them are negative and, and they're out in the street and they're getting fights and 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 they're you know they're tough guys and and when one of them gets shot it's not a complete surprise yeah, right yeah. it's not a complete surprise we it's sad it was shot before <laughs> yeah it's yeah, sad but it's not it's not a complete surprise but somebody like somebody like Jay Jay was a, was a serious family man, was really taking care of his family, was a n very nice guy. As I mentioned, you know, he owned a studio in Queens, which is, when you own a studio, you're in a position to make a lot of money, right? Because you can charge people several hundred dollars an hour to use your studio. Jay had an open door policy at his studio. He would take, he would take in the worst little rapper off the streets, mm -hmm. Right, who wanted to make a demo, somebody who had no chance of succeeding in the record business. We'll just give and he thought, yeah, give him some time, you know, give him some time, just to give a kid some hope, mm -hmm. right? Give, mm -hmm. give a kid a little hope. You know, Jay did that. He had all kinds of people come in and out of there. You know, he didn't have to do that. Um, he devoted a lot of time to his, fa you know, to his family. You know, and took care, took care of his kids, mm -hmm. and he was a very generous guy. You know, when he started getting checks from from um, Run DMC, his Run DMC checks. He splurged, but he splurged on other people. You know, he, he bought his sister a car. You know, he, he bought one of his best friends a car. Mm -hmm. You know, as an incident in the book I mentioned where one of his friends once said, Jay, I like your gold chain, man. That, that's, you know, that's, that's really hot. You know, next day, 
Jay showed up, and he had a bag in his hand, and he handed it to the guy, and there was a gold chain in there. You know, it was a $5,000 gold chain, right? When Jay would go out on the town with his friends, you know, he was the one who was always buying, you know? He'd go from place to place. It'd be 20 people, 20 people following him, mm -hmm. you know, all, all following him, because he was just a generous guy. Did he ever, um, in your research, mm -hmm. or let's just broaden the scope, because I think about people of his ilk, and I think about uh, not just Run DMC, but I think about Cool Mo D. Mm -hmm. I think about the Sugar Hair Gang, uh, Dougie Fresh, you know, all these, these, these uh, uh, original um, rap star, rap artists. Do you ever hear them talk about how the mu music has evolved, but not just so much how it's evolved, but also the direction it's taken. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about it, do they talk about it with mixed emotions? Yeah. Um, I spoke to, there's a DJ uh, in New York, uh, Ed Lover, you might oh, probably yeah, know Ed about. Lover. Yeah, and I spoke to him after Jay was killed. And one of the things he said was he thought that that there ought to be more responsibility um, in in the music, that that, you know, all this gangster rap is fine, but it, it's harsh, and we're losing touch with, with something. Mm. And, and I thought that was a very interesting thing to say. I thought it was, it was right on the money. It's hard to get people to talk about that, because they feel like, like if they're going to say something negative about it, that, that this is how their friends are making money. This mm -hmm. is how their friends are getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And these are people who may not be able to get a paycheck in another way. So, so, so it's, a, it's sort of frowned upon, it's frowned upon to talk about, you know, to say to a guy, well, you know, why don't you change your music because it's too violent? Well, this guy says, well, you know what, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm trying to put bread on the table for my family and this is what's selling. So, so this is the way, you know, this is, this is, these are the messages that, that, that are going to sell. So, so there, you know, there's that aspect to it. Um, it. It's difficult to get people to talk about that. But Ed Lover did say that and I think a lot of people were feeling that after Jay felt a lot after Jay was killed mm -hmm. a lot of people felt in some way that um, that the culture of hip hop was breeding bad ideas mm -hmm. and 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 that this may have had something to do with Jay getting killed now we don't know whether that's a fact or not mm -hmm. because we don't know exactly why Jay was killed mm -hmm. or who was killed but this was a natural assumption after after he was shot that that okay, it was you know this maybe was this some um, was this some aspiring rapper or something who had some beef with Jay over some, you know did this have something to do with with hip hop? It's a natural assumption, and that 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 worried a lot of people, and that I think a lot of people um, became concerned about that. Now to go from that point to actually changing the music, right? Let me cut you off because we're yes. going to talk about that when we come back. Okay. We're going to talk about the direction mm -hmm. and what direction you see hip hop going into right after this. Stay mm -hmm. tuned. We'll be right back. Sure. Tanita Cheatham, and I am having a wonderful discussion with David Thigpen, who is the author of the book, uh, G.I. Master J, The Heart of Hip Hop. It is a uh, biography on uh, G.I. Master J, who was um, of Run DMC fame, who was killed uh, about six, six months ago. Uh, very interesting conversation. Before we left, we were talking about how, um, you know, now hip hop is being fueled because there's this, 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 uh, this desire for it, you know, there's this, this market for it. Uh, but, I mean, gosh, how much violence can you sell, how much booty women shaking in front mm -hmm. of you know, can you sell. It's going, as you said, it's going to top out. And you were talking about how a, uh, a lover, uh, Ed Glover, Ed Lover, mm -hmm. Ed Lover had mm -hmm. talked about um, how it's changed and not so much for the better. Uh, but this all leads me to ask, and I know you've thought about this, what direction is this music form going in? Yeah. Well, I think the way you have to look at it is it's impossible to predict where it's going to go. But what needs to be focused on is people have to put 
some some more love and passion back into the music and that's that's what people will respond to and then then it almost doesn't matter which direction it goes in but as long as is the mu people believe the music is is authentic and it's from the heart and it touches something that they can relate to mm -hmm. then you then you're going to have then it's going to go in an interesting direction and 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 you know this gangster rap thing it will it will top out and it'll happen gradually though it won't it won't just drop off the edge cuz that's the way it is the record companies will usually lag behind what the public wants by six months or a year. So they'll so these records will continue to come out for a while, but they'll stop they'll stop selling as much as they do. And you won't see as many new artists correct promoting that or pushing correct. that come out. Correct. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. It'll take some time. And then what'll happen is you'll find that that there'll be a hit that'll come out of the blue from somewhere. It'll be somebody's doing something totally, totally different, different, you know? Yeah. Like, remember when Prince came out, you yeah. know, a few years ago? Like, yeah. People were like, what the hell is this? This is good. I like this, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it'll be a shock. It'll be a shock to people. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the way it'll work, though. And who knows where it will come from? I personally think it's going to take some time, because this stuff is still selling. Mm -hmm. Gangster rap is still selling. And, and you have these big artists that are, 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 are protégeing these other uh, people that, that are um, correct, into it. So I correct. would agree with you. And, it, and, and you know, the other issue is that it, just, it just, takes, just takes time for something else to develop. And we're in a period now, you know, music really reflects what's going on in, in society, mm -hmm. in the culture. And, we are in a phase right now where gangster rap is, is tends to be kind of a fit with what's what's going on. You know, there's a lot of violence out there, right? A lot of there's a lot of angry people. You know, kids are kids are uh, you know the public schools are in bad shape. You know, you know teachers don't care. You know, parents don't care what their kids do. You know, there's just a lot of problems out there. There's a lot of a lot of anger, and and so so kids sense that. You know, kids, even when they're 11 or 10 years old, they sense that and they pick up these vibrations, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they go to a record store, they want something that's going to reflect how they feel. So they you know? relate to it because they hear someone talking about the same thing yeah, or similar and it, situations yeah, and they can relate to yes, that. Yes, yes, and, it, and it, it, it just it ties in with what they see in their, in their real world. And they, they know if, 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 there's a, if, the, if the new record out is, says, you know, okay, I don't believe in President Bush, and it says, and I don't believe in 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 Mrs. Jones, who's my my seventh grade teacher, and I don't believe in um, uh, you know whatever. I don't believe in in the Boy Scout. You know, okay. it's because well, you gonna have to be careful with that Bush, because I'm sure a lot of people right about now say I don't care for Mr. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to be young to kind of relate to that song, which I can understand. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So so so. Uh, whatever comes along that's new is has to be in touch with with reality. What's going What's going on in the real world, mm -hmm. and that is what people will respond to. People don't want. People do not want a disnified version of the world, right? People don't want to hear just you know positive messages, especially when You're when when you walk yeah when you walk down the block and the, and, there, and there's crack vials down there on the block and, and your next door neighbor has been hit over the head you know and had his had his social security check taken you know you, you don't you don't want to go home and watch a disney movie you know, after that, see, you want if you're if you're young, you know, you want something that that you think is is about the real world that's going to help you, that's like truth, that's going to feel feel like it it means something to you. I think about for me, um, and I don't know, and you can help me with this one. Uh, was Mary J. Blige labeled as a rapper at any time? No, not I, strictly I really as like a. The way her music has evolved. Yeah, I yeah, really do. Yeah. Um, She's she she not only she does she have a great voice yes but she has been well handled by her record label and her people but you know what they call Mary J Blige is is hip hop soul okay she is an R and B singer with hip hop, hip -hop influences yes and that is extremely popular mm -hmm. I mean she she has only gotten more and more popular as she's gone along every album yes. just seems to top the other one but I, the reason why I mentioned her was because as you speak to how uh, youth relate to the words or the messages that are in the music at every level that M uh, Mary J. Bly has evolved because each album has been an involvement in her life. Yes. You know, are things I can relate to. Not to say that I've gone through those things, mm -hmm. but I certainly made that connection. So I say that to say I understood what you were talking about with regard to the kids and they listen to yes. um, the different language, yes. lyrics. In if the you language look at, at Mary J. Blige's r records, they're, uh, especially her later records, they're 
I think the, uh, one of the main themes is about her relationship with men, basically, yes, right? Yes. Or her and, family, and or, yeah, yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. That that kind of that kind of internal, you know, family dynamic, and with men, and and it's about it's about like keeping her self pride against all the all problems that she's going through and, and triumphing over all this stuff. Now, who can't who can't relate to that? Yes, you know, precisely. and especially if you're a young woman, a young black woman. I mean, that's exactly the kind of stuff you want to hear, and it's beautifully packaged, mm -hmm. right, with her great voice, which is a different dynamic from someone like a little Kim. You Absolutely know? right. <laughs> which. She considers herself to be a hardcore rapper. Absolutely right. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I like Little Kim. I wish her well. I will say... There are things to like about her. Yeah. I, I will say that, that this whole kind of sex kitten shtick yeah, is wearing thin. <laughs> it's, it's wearing thin. It is. Yeah, it, it is. And she, need, she needs a new direction. The only problem is when you, when you go that extreme, then... The People public tends to want to you to, say, yeah, but the public tends to, I mean, how do you top that? So you need, you know, if you totally change directions and people wonder, well, I mean, okay, like one minute you were a sex kitten and now you're telling me you're doing something different? I mean, was that whole last thing a fake? See, so she's got herself in a little bit of a bind. Mm. You know, how much farther out can she go with the sex thing, right? I mean, she took it as pretty much as far as it could go, right? Well, they said the same thing with Madonna. But she kind of changed, though. Well, Madonna changes every time. Yeah, she kind of yeah, veered uh, away from the that. The wind changes, I think motherhood and, 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 and being married. Kinda. Sure. Little Kim could do worse than look at Madonna's career and see how she has changed. Mm -hmm. and, and that does keep the public interested in you to see what your next move is. Mm -hmm. Little Kim, though, I think it may be sort of locked into that, to that sexy image. We'll so see. she's got to figure out a way she, we'll see. she can we'll work see. with that. But she's got talent. But you know what? I, I find it interesting uh, someone like, as we're talking about Little Kim, that she's had the mainstay that she's been able to because you have a lot of female rappers that kind of come and go. Yes. Particularly yes. those that purport to be hardcore type rappers. Correct. Uh, that have come and go. But she has had some longevity uh, with regard to what she's doing. She's so. a talented rapper. Mm -hmm. She's a talented rapper. Um, she just needs a little image maintenance, I think. She has been able to stick around even though her last couple records records have not sold terribly well. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Maybe she can come up with something else. But the media certainly is fascinated by her. She gets a lot of press. That keeps her going. I think she's kind of diversified herself, too, because she does some modeling as well. Isn't she does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think MAC Cosmetics or something. Yeah. She's got a contract. Well, I want people to have an opportunity if they want to uh, uh, find out more about your book. Is there a website they can go to? or? Yeah, there's a Simon & Schuster uh, website. It's called simonsays.com, mm -hmm. and the book is on there. Amazon, of course, has it. Okay. Borders carries the book. Mm -hmm. Borders on Michigan Avenue has okay. got it. And Barnes & Noble should also have it. Okay, so you're going to be doing some different book tours and stuff? Uh, I hope so. Yes, yes. Yeah, Hopefully time hope will so. push that uh, with regard to uh, that, because I wanted to give people an opportunity to know that they can um, mm -hmm. um, uh, to uh, order that. But let's talk a little bit more. I, I think... And I, Miss and Mary J. Bly is an example, but I think of other people. It was so interesting. I um, ran into uh, the other day at uh, a bookstore here in Chicago, and I saw Patti LaBelle. She was in town. Mm, she has mm -hmm. a new cookbook. Yeah. Uh, talk about diversifying talent. And I think about people like her. I mean, tremendous crossover appeal. Absolutely. You know, uh, yeah. Even younger generation, yeah. somewhat, can relate to uh, Patti. So there are, sure. you know, you have some people that have longevity. And that, yeah, that's an example of just a, a pure, great voice, yeah. right, that sells itself, right? The I over, felt like the, a little kid. Yeah, I, I mean, the over-the-top over, the over the costumes help, too, yeah. right? But, but she, had a wild, a great, she had a wild phase at one time. Yeah. Uh, what was the group that she sung with? Uh, uh, LaBelle, right? Okay, that was the LaBelle yeah, group. LaBelle, yeah, she was right? kind of like kind of like out there. So yeah. I guess every generation has that and this is just yeah. maybe because we're feeling our age. Sure. We just kinda don't and you have to remember that it's, t it's tougher and tougher to sell records these days with all the videos that are out, right? Computer games, right? There's all kinds of demands on, on people's attention now. Um, so, I mean, you probably spend a lot of the day online yourself, yeah. not just listening to records. Like, used to be you, you could listen to a record or watch TV. You know, now, with computing, there's a million other things to do. So, so it's tough. It's tough for, for artists to, to cut through all the, all the media clutter. So maybe that's why they feel they have to come out that way. Yes, they do. That way. They um, do. They really do. Wow. Yeah. Woo. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Uh, any other last thoughts with regard to this um, topic we're talking about? Well, um, I would say... Um, um, Buy the book. It'll tell you a lot about the evolution of hip-hop, tell you about the evolution of a fascinating 
person who lived a very exciting life. Mm -hmm. It tells you something about where we stand now as a culture. I tried to try to make that point. Uh, and he is just, a, he's a good story. There's a lot instructive in his life, and, and he lived a very short but very exciting life. Okay, let's step back. We have a, a minute or two. Let's talk about our stance of the culture. Mm -hmm. Can I bring that out? What did you talk about? Well, you know, Jam Master J, um, Jam Master J represented an era of hip hop that was different than today. Um, Jam Master J uh, had a lot of fun in life. Um, he kept things light, he never got too serious. He had a good time, but yet he influenced the art form profoundly. Um, that's a model for people to look at for today. You know, there are ways they can do that today. Things have gotten very serious today. You know, and very. And today is all about yeah, signing very this money deal, oriented. signing that deal. Yes. I look at these um, uh, uh, programs, particularly on VH1, because they have a lot of them when they talk about behind the music, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And you have these artists, it's just so quick, quick, quick. It sign is. the book deal, sign the shoe deal, uh, the perfume deal, yeah. uh, the video. You know, all these things they try to do to try to not only be competitive, but to get their, their, their iron as in many fires as possible yes. so that they can, you know, raise as much money as possible. Maybe they have this understanding that, you know, this, as they say, 15 seconds of fame mm -hmm. probably won't be Mm -hmm. that long lived and so mm -hmm. they figured they have to get it all in at one time sure. and that's why you have such a saturation I think of some people and not just rap artists but I think about pop artists you know because have we seen enough of Britney Spears I don't know yeah. uh, that kind of thing yeah. so maybe that's another thing that kind of fuels that as well well the shelf life for an artist the shelf life for fame seems to be what getting be considered shorter a good shelf life? and shorter what would be considered a good shelf life well I'll tell you if you can if you can last 10 years now, that's exceptional. In other words, if you can go from, from uh, one generation's you know, buying, buying point to uh, another generation's buying point, by that I mean, I mean the, the time when, when you buy most of your records, which is usually say like you know, 14, to, 14 to 21. If you can last 10 years, that is truly extraordinary. Most artists do not do that. Most artists, most artists say have like a five year life, something like that. And, and, and I can give you a very good example. It, look at the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, the yeah. Spice Girls, you know, Britney Spears. I mean, all these, all these were extremely famous artists at the time, right? You will not be hearing about them. Well, in the future. I think about Janet Jackson's going to be forever, but David, I want to thank you for coming to the program. It was my it's pleasure. Really interesting. Uh, okay. Come back and visit us when you do your next book. I will. And thank you for tuning in. Until next time, as always, thank you. God bless.